My name is Paul Shelley, welcome to the Astro Historian, and welcome to another system survey. This is a sub-series where I look at specific systems and planets in sci-fi universes and discuss their impact on lore. This system survey is on a system so crime-ridden that it was once known as the crossroads of crime, Nexus. Before we get started, I want to personally thank y'all for your continued support. We are growing fast and it has all to do with y'all spreading the word. If this is your second time enjoying one of my videos, then you should hit that subscribe button. And if you really like this, then hit the bell icon to be notified when these come out. With that said, let's look at the Nexus system. The story of Nexus dates back to 2445, when Dominic Thapa, a UNE Navy pilot, was probing the classified military system of Cathcart for new jump points. On March 9th, he found one that led into a new system. Shortly afterwards, a Pathfinder team was dispatched to explore the system, which the military named UDS-2445-3-09. They discovered a system with a bluish-white A-type main sequence star, five planets, and a mineral-rich asteroid belt. The first planet is a protoplanet that is dangerously close to its star. Its surface is covered with reddish-black rock, which is rich with carbon. Because of the proximity of the planet to its star, the surface is very dangerous to travel, let alone mine. The second planet is a smog world with a dense, nitrogen-rich atmosphere, and because of its unique atmospheric composition, had the potential to be the first smog world to be terraformed. The third planet is an extreme rarity, a planet capable of supporting life naturally. Combined with the fourth planet being a great candidate for terraforming, this made the system instantly desirable from the start. In between the third and fourth planet is what sealed the deal on the system, a dense asteroid belt teeming with valuable materials ready to be mined. The last planet in the system is a gas giant, which has swirling clouds of red and brown. This all meant that this new system was far too lucrative to ignore. However, the UNE had one problem. The only jump point to the system went through the classified Cathcart system. Initially, the Navy solved this problem by attempting to terraform and mine the system themselves, using the second planet to test prototype terraforming techniques to turn smog planets into habitable worlds. Unfortunately, it was around this time that the government started facing a significant budget shortfall, and the expensive development of the system was quickly placed on the chopping block. The military didn't want to allow access to Cathcart, so a compromise was settled upon. In a first, the government allowed a single company to develop the system. The military felt it would be easier to control access to the system if only a single corporate group was allowed to travel through Cathcart. So they sold the mining rights to the Hathor Group in January 2468 for a massive amount of credits, which was then used to fill the budget gap. It is likely that this was the precedent that would eventually lead to the sale of Stanton to several companies as a means to fill a budget shortfall 400 years later. It should also be noted that this was a political move. The party in charge of Congress, the Universalists, were able to prevent raising taxes by this sale, which would lead to their political victory in close elections of 2468. The Hathor Group was given a lot of free reign over the system and took advantage of this control to leverage maximum profits. As years went on and the Navy abandoned the Cathcart system, several outlaw groups began to set up shop in the mothballed capital ships the Navy left behind. These groups would eventually make their way into what was now known as the Hathor system, raiding and stalking transports filled with ore. Hathor did little to stop this activity other than increase security, which pushed these outlaws to harass other residents. Soon, gambling, violence, and other vices became the staples of the system. As Hathor would muscle anyone who tried to get a foothold in the system legitimately, even other ventures stayed away from the system. So by the 26th century, crime was the only viable profession outside of mining. Hathor continued to exploit the system for its resources, while turning a blind eye to criminal activity all around for centuries before abandoning the system officially in 2672 due to ballooning cost of security and dwindling profits. In their wake, they left a devastated wasteland on the third and fourth planets with no civilian infrastructure. So it isn't surprising that once Hathor had left, criminal elements flooded in to fill the vacuum of power. It was at this point the system likely gained the name it has today, Nexus, for its unique location being connected to many other trade lanes in the Empire. Ironically, the system was a hub of large jump points, with three others discovered after the system was first surveyed, which led to Hades, Min, and Ellis. 
This meant that Nexus was often a route for larger ships needing to make it between the western and eastern halves of the Empire. With plenty of facilities and rubbish left over from Hathor's time in the system, Nexus IV became the main hub of activity. It was named Lago by the locals, which was a fictional pirate haven in a 26th century movie, and had the most well-defended and populated outlaw settlements in the UEE. While the focal point of outlaw settlement was Lago, Nexus III and the asteroid belt, known as the El Cibre belt, were also quickly taken over by various outlaw gangs. Stations that once processed ore were now home to raiders, smugglers, and hit squads. Echo 11 was one such station, now home to the ruthless Argol Dawn. The entire system began to morph into this new identity. Even Nexus V would earn the name The Red God by the cryptic Sangresta's gang who believed the planet had mysterious powers. By the 30th century, the system was thought to have swelled to such a monumental size that they rivaled the outlaw haven of Spider and Cathcart in terms of population, size, and power. It was in 2925 when the system was dubbed The Crossroads of Crime, thanks to a documentary filmed about the operations in and around the system. It was said that crime committed anywhere in the verse could eventually be traced back to Nexus. There was a local saying that, all roads lead to Nexus, and you'll probably get robbed on all of them. Truly, Nexus was the growing heart of an outlaw empire. This would all change in 2931, when Dean Keller got a bit too drunk in a bar in Spider and murdered an undercover advocacy agent over an argument about Anvil Hornets in plain sight. This kicked off a several-day multi-system chase by outlaws, bounty hunters, and the advocacy to try and kill Keller. In the end, he was gunned down in the Nexus system, giving the system even more of a bad reputation. While the advocacy had tried to maintain some order since the fall of the Mezzers, there hadn't been enough resources to police more populated systems, let alone an outlaw-owned one. However, after the outrage and embarrassment that was Keller's run, the UEE government authorized a joint UEE military and advocacy invasion of the system to bring law and order. The first stop was Nexus III the former headquarters of the Hathor Group, and a strategically significant planet for control of passage through the system. However, this would not go as well as they hoped. The quarreling outlaw groups of Nexus III set aside their differences and united against the UEE forces. The Horizon crew rose up to become the de facto leaders of this resistance and made the UEE pay for every bit of territory they are able to take. One of the first engagements of this invasion was between an elite tactical group of advocacy agents and a stubborn gang known as the Supreme, who held a stronghold on the planet. The fighting was brutal, with the Supreme eventually retreating to an orbital mining laser, threatening to destroy the facilities to prevent the UEE from controlling their stronghold. The outlaws fought tooth and nail, and while their fight was spirited, the outlaws were no match to the might of a UEE battle group, and those who didn't flee were either killed or captured. After three years of brutal fighting, Nexus III was under UEE control for the first time in almost 500 years. Advocacy agents then began rooting out outlaws in the belt and on Lago. At Echo 11, the advocacy was able to dislodge the Argol Dawn, but on Lago, things were slow going, with outlaws destroying at least one settlement, Arjul, with an orbital strike in order to keep it out of the hands of the UEE as it was one of only two settlements on the planet with proper landing facilities. However, the other settlement, the settlement of Rhys, was captured by the UEE, who planned to use it as a starting point for settlement. The families of advocacy and military forces fighting in Nexus were brought into the system and given sweet deals on the valuable land of Lago. The hope was by bringing outside civilians to tame the wild frontier, it would pacify the system naturally over time. The main staging point for these families was an old operation station called OP Station Damien, orbiting Nexus II. Additional HABs were built to house these families as they waited for transports to take them to Lago. What the residents didn't know was the Horizon crew had made it back into the system and saw the station as a great staging ground for their operations. So on January 10th, 2935, they surprised the sleepy station and massacred the crew and families on board. Thanks to the child of Agent Emily Walzer, Alerting the outside world, the plan had been found out before the crew was able to fortify their positions well enough. However, it still took hours of fighting and the UEE Marines arriving to support local forces before the Horizon crew was removed from the station. This brutal attack is known today as the Walzer Massacre and has added another black mark to the system's already long list of embarrassments to the UEE.
Today, while Reese remains in UEE hands, the system is still in bitter contention, with UEE and local militia forces struggling to remove the dug-in presence of outlaws on Lago. Still, some order is returning, with recent technological advances allowing for prospectors to once again reach valuable materials in the belt. So once again, the system is slowly morphing into a new one. Yet, even still, with the Vanduul War raging and, and budgets getting tight in the UEE, anything is possible in this crossroads of crime. That was the history and lore of Nexus. I hope you enjoyed our look at this outlaw haven. If you did, remember to tap that like button and tell your friends in order to spread the word. I'd also like to thank those Patreons on screen now for helping me make this all possible. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. For as little as $5 a month, you get ad-free and early access to videos, including a timed exclusive covering the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, whose first two episodes have recently been released to the public. Check it out now to see what $5 a month will get you. For now, let me know what other system you want me to cover in the comments below. And as always, remember, ex historia ad astra.